please be aware, if you have children in the room, this sermon will contain mature content. What's up, Victory? Hey, hey, fam. Hey, guys. Uh, hey, real quick, let's give it up for uh, everybody joining us online. We got some of our Norcross uh, family who's still online with us. We also got people from Panama, South Sudan, and Japan who are with us online today. What's up, everybody? Hey, welcome out. Um, hey, real quick, I wanna kind of shed some light on what's gonna happen next weekend. I wanna give some clarity to that, to this big outdoor service that we're having. So just, just a few little notes. We are gonna be outside. We're gonna be in the parking lot. You don't bring a tent. Don't bring a sleeping bag. We're not making s'mores. Like, hey, we'll have chairs for you out there. Um, since we are outside, one point is masks are gonna be recommended but not required, okay? So we're gonna make that shift while we're outside out there. Um, here, here's what I'll tell you what this is not. This is not a political rally. What's gonna happen next week? So leave your banners, your flags, your no t-shirts, flag. your no bumper banners. stickers yeah. at home. I am not gonna tell you who to vote for next week so you can stop sending me emails telling me on both sides to tell everybody who to vote for. Uh, what this is, it's an opportunity for victory, for the church, for Hamilton Mill to come down, Midtown to come up, some of you who've been online for a while to actually take the step, I'm already getting those messages, to take that step to start being a part of the weekly gathering again. And for us to join together as Capital V Victory, um, and, and it's one church is the people of God and probably the most divided time, at least in my generation, um, and, and this is an opportunity for us as the family to lift up one voice to our one father, come on, to pray with one voice, to get united because a house divided is gonna fall. And so we're gonna come together. We're gonna embrace 2 Chronicles seven fourteen that if God's people were called by his name, would humble themselves and pray. And so we're gonna pray. We're gonna kick off a nine-day fast. Amen. All right, next Sunday, a nine-day fast leading into the election because this is important, guys. And this is a time for the people of God. Listen, the world's gonna be jacked up, all right? But the church has to be united, Yes. all right? And so we're gonna have an opportunity to do that next Sunday. So please, everybody, bring your wife, bring your kids, don't hide them, and let's <laughs> come on out uh, to the service next Sunday, okay? Um, but today, all right, everybody say today. Today, we are finishing our series called Explicit, uh, where we've been talking about sex in church, y'all. All right, so first week, kicked it off, talked about sex and God and uh, how every single one of us is made for intimacy. Uh, second week, we talked about porn and porn culture and how we as the people of God have to rediscover the Imago Dei, the image of God that's on every single person. Last weekend, uh, Pastors Darius and Melbo were up here with some of our pastors doing Q&A. Woo! Wow, I was, I was even part of like putting that together and I was like <laughs> squirming in my seat because it was so real, the stuff that we were talking about last week. And today, 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 uh, I love this. Uh, my wife Summer and I, we are up here to uh, talk about sexual healing. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah, baby. Now, I'm excited. I'm really excited because, you know, Jonathan has been um, just putting this over this last month, talking about sexual healing, talking about all these different things. And Pastors Darius and Melba were here with us last week. But today, we are actually going to dive into healing. We're going to discuss these things because here's what we know. When we look at the world, we know all is not well in the world when it comes to sex. Yeah. Right? Let's be real. We live in a world that thinks it can do what it wants, when it wants, doesn't matter what you think. Hey, you're just not gonna suffer consequences, but that's not true. And so because of that, you know, conversations we get in with different people, whether it's in the lobby or we get messages or whatnot, we see abuse, we see pain, and we see shame all around us. And so to all of that, like we wanna get back to what does it look like to have that healing and that sexual healing in Jesus. And in fact, we simply, if we look back at the scripture in uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse eight, it says this, but it was not this way from the beginning. 
was not this way from the beginning. That's what Jesus is saying. So over and over, he's telling us, hey, it wasn't this way in the beginning. He's taking us back to original intent. He's taking us back to the garden in Genesis. And he's trying to remind us that at the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve came on the world, before sin entered the world, it was pure. It was pure. Before centered in the world and people twisted and perverted sex, there was purity and God had an original plan for us. Yeah, and many of you, you know the original plan. We've talked about it, but let's go back again. Genesis 2, 24, 25 says this. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife and they become one flesh. And the two of them, the man and his wife were naked, but they felt no shame. <sighs> Do you feel the simplicity of that, right? Come on, that's not complicated. When you think about relationships today, it's complicated. When you think about emotions and identity today, it's complicated. When you think about sex today, it's complicated, but it wasn't that way from the beginning, right? God's plan is for one husband, one wife to become one flesh, naked and unashamed. That's it. It's not complicated, right? We know that naked physically, but also maybe even greater naked emotionally. This is, we talked about this a few weeks ago, yada. This means to know, this deep knowing, this permeating knowing. Not, not just a naked physically, but a naked with your dreams and your right. thoughts and your hopes and your failures and your successes and where I wanna go and where are we gonna go together. Like this, this nakedness, but the greatest thing is nakedness without shame, right? I can, I, can, I can give you all of me and I'm not like, oh, like hiding and that there's a complete nakedness. But here's what we know is that that's Genesis 2. But then Gen a lot can happen in a chapter. Right. <laughs> right? Genesis 3 happens, right? And what happens is Adam and Eve, they take things into their own hands. They take a bite of the fruit, right? right? And all of a sudden, everything starts breaking down. Sin enters into the world, death by sin, separation from God. And not just that, separation from each other. Right. The first thing that dies between them is naked and unashamed. Right, because the first thing Adam says is like, hey God, it's not my fault, it's her fault. In fact, it's actually your fault because you gave her to me. All I know is it's not my fault. And these relationships, it's, it's blame shifting, it's pointing of fingers. Right. And so nakedness gets corrupted, it gets polluted. Sex gets sinful, sex gets shameful, sex gets inappropriate and twisted. And you fast forward right. to today and sex is God. Sex is God, sex sells. But it wasn't this way from the beginning. God has a better plan than what we see playing out in the world all around us. Because we have a God who loves white wedding dresses. We have a God who loves white wedding dresses. We have a God who loves singles thriving and being single. We have a God, that's right, go ahead, woo woo. I got the woo woo, all right now. Yeah. We have a God who loves marrieds thriving in marriage and having a great marriage. He loves that. We have a God who loves it when we, as his people, are thriving in purity, in joy, and in love. But for all those things to happen and to have those in full effect, we're gonna need sexual healing. We're gonna need it. So today, Johnson and I, we're gonna talk about the top three areas where we spend the most time with people, whether it's in counseling or talking with them, walking them through different things, where they need healing. So listen, it might get a little uncomfortable in here. I'm just gonna tell you right now. So don't be like, if your neighbor is just looking straight ahead, don't be looking at them. Don't be like making eye contact or elbowing somebody next to you, right? I want you to embrace. It's, it's gonna, we're gonna talk about some hard things, but I want you to prepare your heart to receive because here is what we know, that if we can get these three things today that we feel like God has given us to minister to you, that it's gonna lead us towards the freedom, the health, and the wholeness that Jesus wants to give each and every one of us. And I know you want that, we want that. Yeah. So when you're hot like an oven and you need some loving. <laughs> so when you get that feeling, from now on, you're gonna know how you can actually get sexual healing. All right, it's not through the song, it's through Jesus. All right, <laughs> here we go. Here's the top three areas that need sexual healing. Here's the first one is our ties. Everybody say ties. 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 Um, I remember the first counseling appointment, the f not even the first day, the f I mean the first week, the first day of when we started Victory Hamilton Mill 10 years ago, over 10 years ago. Um, I walked into the office and they just kind of sh shed light on um, a wife had just left her husband 
in the church um, because she reconnected with an old high school flame on Facebook. And now there's this husband who's left trying to put it all together again. There's, there's two kids who are left thinking it's their fault. There's a church family that's left trying to, to help and hold it together. And I wish that that was the only time we'd ever heard that story. Any of y'all heard that story before? In one of its thousand different variations, there's a re, right, R-E. There's a reconnecting that happens. And I think here's what we have to understand is that that's not just part of life. That is not, um, that's not a result of boredom and marriage. There are spiritual realities that are happening here. You know, this, this battle isn't just against flesh and blood. There's, there's, there's something deeper going on here. And along the way, we learned about this thing called a soul tie, right. a soul tie. Um, in fact, we took a, a clip from um, really briefly, a number of years ago, I talked about a soul tie in a message. And we took that clip, threw it online under the title on YouTube, under, under the title, Why Sexual Sins Are Different Than Other Sins. And as of like last night, it had like 700,000 views and like 3,000 comments. Because people are so fascinated. It's something that we know is true, but we can't describe it. We can't put our finger on it about these like seeming magnetic attractions, right? That draw us back, make us think about, make us fantasize, make us have these concerns, whatever it is about people from our past or even people from our present. And many times they're not even things that we want active in our life, but it seems like we can't get away from them. We learned about this thing called a soul tie. Yeah, I think, you know, even when Johnson and I first got married, um, it was hard for us to connect. I mean, I think we can say that. Um, it was almost like, I felt like, not that he said it, but I felt like he was always comparing me to women from his past. Like he was judging me. Did I look like them? Was I like, just all those different things. And he felt like I was comparing him to guys from my past. Right? It was almost like there was this invisible, unspoken wall that was between us. And then we learned about this thing called a soul tie. We were like, why didn't somebody tell us about this before we got married? Yeah. And a soul tie is this. It's an unseen connection that ties us to a relationship. It's an unseen connection that ties us to a relationship. And so here's where we get the scriptural idea of a soul tie. I wanna read it to you here. It's found in 1 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18. It says this. There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. Since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. There is a sense in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. These bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love for becoming one with another. Or didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit, don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? Wow. God designed sex to make us one in marriage, one in marriage. And so here's the reality. There is a DNA exchange that happens, but there is also an exchange of our soul connection with someone else, and that's a deep connection that happens with somebody else. And the truth is this, we're gonna experience consequences if we have someone have sex with someone outside the covenant of marriage, if we try to have sex and walk away. And Johnson alluded to this earlier, but a good soul tie between married couples, it does, it draws you to one another like magnets. Drawing close to my baby right here, right? But soul ties um, with people who have crossed the lines outside of marriage, outside the covenant of marriage, it also draws them back together too. Even if it was a one night stand, even if that person lives in another state or it happened years ago. So many times people feel like, hey, I'm gonna get married and you know what, I'm closing that book, I'm starting a, a new book and life moves on. No, 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 no. It's the same book, but it's a new chapter in that book. And so if you had a relationship with somebody, a sexual relationship with somebody outside the covenant of marriage, until you break that soul tie, it's gonna remain. Mm -hmm. 
fact, uh, in our first few years of marriage, I was having dreams about uh, a guy I'd been intimate with in a relationship six, probably five or six years before Johnson and I ever even met. And so every time I'd have these dreams, Johnson would be basically like right where he is in the dream next to me, not saying anything, but this guy would be pursuing me in my dreams. I would feel like I am in a relationship with him. I, I was in a relationship with him again. So much that when I would wake up, I felt like I had just cheated on Johnson. Or is that like, I'm, let me just be real. I'm like, is my ring on? Okay, yeah, wait, are we married? Oh, there you are. You are alive in the bed. I am married, okay. <laughs> it was just a dream, deep breaths. But the reality was this, is that I was having all these dreams about this former relationship, and even though uh, this guy lived like 10 states away, just because there was physical separation, a spiritual connection hadn't been broken. And here's how I know that. This guy had died in a car accident three years prior to me having all these dreams. So we're married, and I'm having dreams about a guy who's died that I had an intimate relationship with. See, the soul tie between two people is not broken, like I said, by a physical separation or distance. You can live here in Georgia, they can live in California, they can live in Washington, D.C., New York, I don't know where. But just because you're physically separated by distance doesn't mean that's broken. It has to be broken in the spirit because it's a spiritual connection. Yeah. And, and, and let me add another layer here because everybody's on guard yeah, I can say this in church, right? Well, even if not. You're gonna say it. I'm the so pastor, it doesn't I can matter. say whatever I want to. Um, <laughs> You're gonna say Everybody's it. on guard for STDs, right? And so uh, sexually transmitted diseases for, for the, if you're hiding under a rock today. Um, and rightly so, right? I mean, that's, that's a very real thing. But there's actually something more powerful and more dangerous than STDs. We call them STEs, sexually transmitted emotions. And the reality is this, a condom can't prevent you from getting STEs. A condom can prevent you from getting syphilis, but it can't prevent you from getting a soul tie, right? There's no like warning on a package. It's like 100% effective against rejection. Right. Hey, or great. Right. Hey, guilt-free. No consequences here, right? 100% effective against d- depression, rejection, abandonment, one night stands. It can't protect you from those sorts of things because there, there are deeper realities that are going on than just mere skin on skin. Sex is just as much what spiritual mystery than physical fat. And, and here's the truth. We were made to have a soul tie with one other person, right? Our spouse. But when we go outside that, when it happens outside that, there are going to be consequences. Now, here's the deal. I heard, even heard some of you like, like I, no, I haven't had sex. Come on. I know we get like, well, what exactly is sex? So we made a chart. No, I did. No, All we, right, did. You we know, did not. No, we did not. Come on, somebody. Well, I'm a technical virgin. All right, <laughs> listen, listen, listen. We've got enough technical virgins in the church. All right? This thing is not about virginity. It's about purity. Amen. The goal isn't virginity. The goal is purity, okay? And so you've crossed lines. Many of us, we cross lines. And there there are consequences to that. There's side effects to that. It's like gluing two sheets of paper together and then trying to rip them apart. It's not gonna be clean. There's gonna be fragments that are left over. And that that's that's just this is maybe this all begins to explain why you still think about that person or you still dream about that person, or there's still thoughts or fears or sexual desires, and you're like, I don't want that stuff anymore, but it's because there's fragments. Right? And and this is why we say this, okay? This is why we say it this way. The promise of two becoming one is the greatest blessing inside of marriage, but it's the greatest curse outside of marriage. Because because here's what we say. We're like, no, it was just a one night stand. Oh, no, it was just three months. Oh, it wasn't a big deal. Oh, we weren't married. Oh, I, you know, it was, it was, uh." listen, we can choose our consequences. We can choose our choices, but we can't choose our consequences. Right? Right? God's the one who made us. He's the one who designed how this thing works. And if you connect, you connect. And ties are formed. Now, here's the good deal. We're not gonna just leave you in that place. We're gonna pray through those things in just a few minutes, okay? All right, so there's the first one. Top three areas that need sexual healing. The first thing is is soul ties. Second thing is this, is traumas. We got ties and we got traumas. Um, Here's how we would uh, define a trauma. Trauma is basically an unwanted... um, distressing experience that happens to you where a wound is created. All right, the key word there is wound. A wound is created, something where like even years later, if you touch it, 
Somebody talks about it, you think about it, there's still pain associated with that thing. You can deny it to everybody else all day long, but you know that there's pain, there's a wound that took place there because of a distressing experience. So maybe you were, you were physically abused, maybe you were sexually abused, maybe you were emotionally abused, uh, maybe you weren't ever told that you were loved, maybe you were never hugged by your parents. Uh, it could be an active thing or it could be a lack of a thing, right? Uh, it could be you were abandoned or it could be, uh, I talked to somebody not too long ago and uh, he said that his girlfriend told him, I could never make marry you because you're not a good leader. And what that did, it left this like wound, this scar on his heart. And now here's the thing, we can pretend all day long like that doesn't matter, but here's some statistics real quick. 97% of people with sex addiction suffered emotional abuse in childhood. 97%. 81% suffered sexual abuse. 72% suffered from physical abuse. Now, here's the real key. People with a history of trauma can manifest a variety of different responses that are rooted in their traumatic experiences. And what this is saying is simply this. Your past can influence your present. Mm -hmm. Right? Again, we can pretend all day long like it doesn't. But your past, if you don't deal with it, comes into your present. Why? Because your wounds talk to you. Mm -hmm. Your wounds talk to you. Your wounds tell you this is how life is. This is how life works. This is what you need to do. Your wounds talk to you, and then you form responses in, in, in a reaction to your trauma. And the, the two probably primary responses that we see are what we would call judgments and inner vows. Right. You need to write those down, judgments and inner vows. These are the two responses. These are the things that we have to deal with with trauma. And I, I'd like to say this too. When those traumas or things happen and those wounds happen, many times unintentionally, these judgments and inner vows are created, yeah. right? Sometimes knowingly, but lots of times unknowingly, they're just there. And, and really, this became real to us about five years ago. And uh, I'll never forget it. We were reminiscing on this the other day. Um, we were in this huge argument. We can't tell you what we were arguing about because we don't even remember what we were arguing about, but we remember where we were and we remember how heated the argument was. And uh, I'll never forget it. Johnson, um, during the argument, looked over me. He was like, why are you being so combative? And like, truthfully, internally, I was like, why am I being combative? Why are you being combative, right? <laughs> now, I didn't say that. I didn't say it back to him, but internally, I was like, you're the one that's being combative. I'm being fine. You have an attitude. So, but... As a good wife, I submitted and said, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me for being combative. And I truly did say that and said, would you please forgive me? And, and we made up. I apologized. And we made up. And I went on my day and we went on our marriage and you know, things were fine. But those words will, were still there. So about six months later, uh, I'm at a training in Dallas for what is now our forward classes. And uh, you get paired up with different people. And I got paired up with this lady for my print partner. And she looks over to me and she says, mm, I hear God saying that you've been combative with your husband. Get her, God. Seriously. <laughs> I'm like, seriously, God? Come on. <laughs> right? Who uses the word combative? Right? I'm like, and so I was like, dang it. All right, fine. And I, I knew God was speaking. Now, it, I was like, what are you trying to say, right? So I got in this place of just receiving from him, and I put my head down, and I, I began to ask God about the situation. And I said, God, what do you want to show me about this word combative? Why am I being this way? Why do I need to seek you? And he took me back, and I saw myself. I was probably eight or nine years old. I, I saw myself sitting. I mean, I can tell you where I was in our house. And he said, there's something that happened in this moment. And I said, what happened in this moment? Again, I was probably eight or nine years old. He said, this is when you made a decision to be your own protector and not allow me or your husband to cover you. He said, this decision was made after the trauma you went through of being molested. You made a judgment on all men, not just the man who hurt you, but you made a judgment on all men that said, men will always hurt me. I wanna give you a definition of a judgment. A judgment is this, it's a decision we make about a, piece, uh, a person or people group in response to a trauma. I mean, that could be men are always gonna hurt me, right? Like I just said, it could be women are always gonna try and control me or women will never truly give me what I mean, what I need. It could be my body is dirty, my body is unclean, nobody's ever gonna fully love me. 
But let me just say this. It's very important for us to, to understand this. When someone sins and they commit a trauma against us, we call it sin, yeah. all right? We don't dumb it down. Oh, that never happened. Oh, I just forgive them. No, no, no. We call it out and we say that was a sin. I should never have been sinned against. We acknowledge it, but then what we do is we let God shine his light on it and say, God, I need you to come in and heal this. We have to be so careful not to make permanent judgments based on a temporary trauma that doesn't dismiss the sin that was committed against you, but we don't wanna make a permanent decision for people groups moving forward. Because the reality is if you hold on to that trauma, if you hold on to that judgment, what ends up happening is you form an inner vow. Right, so for me, right, I, I formed that inner vow and I was like, all right, I'm gonna protect myself. Nobody else is gonna protect me. See, an inner vow is this. An inner vow is a decision on how life works, but it's rooted in judgment. It's a decision on how life works, but it's rooted in judgment. So for me, the inner vow was, men are always gonna hurt me, so I'll always have a backup plan in marriage. Even though I'm married to this amazing, godly man who loves Jesus, I'm always gonna have a backup plan, right? That was my inner vow. For you, it could be, I'll never let anyone get close to me again. Yeah. I'll never trust anyone. I'll never let a woman control me. I'll never let a man control me. It could be, I have to always look perfect, or hey, I, I don't need to feel pain, I don't feel pain, I just learn from it and move on. When we don't deal with those things and allow God to shine his light on it, it just stays there. And we can form those judgments and inner vows. Leviticus 4, uh, 5 verses four through five says this, suppose you make a foolish vow of any kind, whether its purpose is for good or for bad, when you realize it's foolishness, you must admit your guilt. When you become aware of your guilt in any of these ways, you must confess your sin. So here God's showing me I've been combative, right? Here's a scripture that tells me this is what I'm supposed to do with that. This is what I'm supposed to do with that judgment and inner vow. So I came before the Lord in, in a bawling heap of crying mess and snot and just said to him, God, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Would you please forgive me for the judgment that I made on all men, for the inner vow that I created on me being my own protector? Would you forgive me? I want to receive your healing. And then I came home and in a bawling mess of snot as well <laughs> um, and crying, I said that same thing to Johnson and he forgave me. And when that happened, this deeper connection with Jesus happened inside my heart and my soul. And this freedom came and it came in my relationship with Christ, but it also came in our relationship with one another as husband and wife. Yeah, so how I get this mental picture of a, of a judgment and an inner vow is almost like a, like a walnut like a pecan, something like that, you know, where um, an event happens, a wound happens, and a judgment is, like she said, is basically, just imagine a judge, right, gavel in the hand. So a judge is, hey, a man did that, or a woman did that, and pop, 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 that's how it is. I have now decided everybody who looks like that is that. I take it outside of sex. All black people, all white people, all Republicans, all Democrats, like, I have decided. Yep. I have made a judgment on this reality that everybody is that. And then what happens is, is that the inner vow is then formed mm -hmm. to protect that belief. Mm -hmm. So if Summer says, hey, um, the judgment is all men are gonna hurt me, I'm gonna form an inner vow that says, well, then I have to protect myself. Mm -hmm. Because this is a judgment on the inside of this. Well, then I, I have to do this. I, you know, my, my, my judgment is I'm not valuable by myself. The inner vow is then I have to be significant in my own right. I have to climb the corporate ladder. I have to conquer women. Whatever that thing is, that inner vow is right. then formed. And so what happens is if I'm being really honest, so she, she comes back, we sit on the couch. I still remember that. And so she's pouring this out. I don't really have a framework for... I'm not really understanding what she's saying because honestly, I just thought she was always grumpy. I wasn't always grumpy. <laughs> no, but like, you know, you get in these arguments and you're thinking to yourself, this should not be an argument. Like, what do we have? You know, is this just how it's always gonna be? But I didn't know there were deeper realities right. going on here. Trump. And if I, just, just give me grace when I say this. <laughs> <laughs> this is why some of you are still single. 
Or this is why some of you have jacked up marriages. Because a man did something to you or a woman did something to you, you formed a judgment, created an inner vow. I'm never gonna let a man do that to me ever again. And so you wear that and then you wonder, why, why can't I get married? Because you have this bow up thing. Or a, a man's like, I'm never gonna let a woman control me, but I wanna get married. And so as soon as it smells like that, mm -hmm. as soon as she says something that reminds you of mom, right. fly off the handle. Right. And you think, well, this is just how it is. I, just, I was justified to do that because you're connecting what she did back to what mom did. She's not your mom. Nope. He's not your dad. He's not that guy. But there's judgments in their inner vows at work. And this is why, time out, this is why we have to pray yeah. that God would come and reveal these things. Because the truth is with judgment and inner vows, for most of us, they've been a, a part of our life for so long, we don't even see them anymore. Right. Because we're, they're now the glasses that we look at life through. Right. Well, this is just men are always like that, or white people are always this, or women are always like that, or a boss is always like this, and so this is what I have to do. Like, we've made these inner vows about our worldview, about how we're gonna live life. And so when, I, I guarantee you, 90% of you right now are like, next. Oh, this isn't me. It's because, you, you ever see somebody with glasses on their head, and they're like, hey, have you seen my glasses? Right? This is our inner vows and judgments. We wear them all the time, but we don't, we're not aware of them because we've been wearing them for so long. Right. And so we need to pray that God would shine his, his light, light. Amen. and reveal those lies, those judgments, those vows that, that we've made somewhere along the way. Okay. So, uh, and we're going to do that in just a minute. All right. But first, the third thing. All right. So we got ties, we got traumas, and we got thrones. Thrones. All right, so last week, um, yeah, last week, uh, Summer and I were driving downtown to go to our new Midtown building. Come on, Jesus. Uh, to meet Pastor Mo and Kendra to, uh, to, to record the video that we showed here last week. If not, if you didn't see it, it's, it's on social. Um, and on our way down there, whatever exit we took, uh, took us right by a strip club. And so I was like, thank you, Jesus, for the example for today. Yeah. And it was 12.30 in the afternoon, and there's cars parked out front. <laughs> and is it just, just come on, like, can we add another? You just got to laugh or you cry. There were like cones out for social distancing, and I'm like, <laughs> we're doing social distancing at a strip club. And I had this, super honest, I had this simultaneous disgust mm -hmm. and sadness. Yeah. Like the sadness, hey, there are, there are women made in the image of God in there right now taking their clothes off. There are men made in the image of God who are on their lunch hour throwing money on a stage. And it just, it, it, honestly, it, it did this thing on the inside of me. I'm like, how do you get there? Right. Right? Like, how, how do you get to a strip club on a Thursday at lunch? And I was just like, I'm trying to play it out in my head. Like, hey, it's 11.45. Like all hours of the day. No, it's 11.45. Yeah. Hey, it's about time to eat. Where should I go to eat? Grab some wings, go to the strip club, come back and <laughs> do customer support. Do IT. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just like, what is, how? How do you get to that place? Because you don't start there. Right. Come on, somebody. Go with me. You don't start there. Nobody's first thing is like, I know what I'll do. Thursday afternoon, 1230, I'm gonna go to the strip club. You don't start there. Romans 6, 19. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. Right. And what Paul is saying right here, listen, he's saying that like attracts like, right? Righteousness leads to more righteousness but sin leads to more sin. Sin never says wait, sin never says less. Sin always says now, and sin always says more, right? And so what it is, just as there's a righteousness that leads to holiness, there's also a sin that leads to ever increasing, descending spiral of wickedness, yeah. right? Because you don't start there, all right, you don't start there. You start here and you descend to that place. And, and this, is, this is how, listen, let me just play it out. This is how a curiosity about sex, a natural curiosity about sex, leads to staring, leads to clicking, 
leads to glancing at porn, leads to watching porn, leads to darker porn, leads to paying for porn, leads to going outside that, to now view real women in the flesh, going to a strip club, leads to an affair, leads to rape. And some of you are like, no, that's not how it works. And you're upset that I created a flow chart of sin. Like, no, no, I, I, that would never happen to me. Let me ask you a question, especially, let me ask you online, okay? Because I know nobody in here has ever thought that. How many people's eyes have you stared into mm-hmm. who their husband just left? Because he connected to an old flame mm-hmm. or his pornography was exposed and it didn't just stay at pornography, it turned into real affair. And the pornography was bad enough, but then he left you. How many people have you stared into those eyes? How many children have you had to be able to basically tell if dad's never coming back? How many people have you stared in their eyes when they just got arrested for going to hook up with a minor? How many people have you talked to in prison because they were in jail for rape? And every single person, with tears in their eyes, they all say, I don't know how I got here. I know exactly how you got there, ever increasing wickedness. Because nobody wakes up one morning saying, hey, I'm gonna go sleep with a 14 year old. Right. You feed it and you feed it and you feed it and you feed it and you try and play patty cake with porn like it's no big deal. Porn, there is no truce with sin, guys. Because right behind that sin is an enemy who wants to steal and kill and destroy everything about your life. There is no truce with sin, no truce with sin, because it wants to absolutely consume you. Sin always says more. It never says wait. And it's ever spiraling descent out of control. And we can call it sin. We can. It is sin. But it's too easy to call it sin because we just kind of lump it in with everything. Oh, it's just a sin, right? No, this is at its root, this is idolatry. Mm -hmm. And what it really is, it's a throne issue. The question is this, what sits on the throne of your life? What sits on the throne of your life? If, If... you know, when Jesus has this interaction with the rich young ruler, I don't know if you know that story, where basically, you know, this rich guy comes and says, hey, what do I need to do to follow you, Jesus? And Jesus turns around and says, hey, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And the guy leaves sad because he doesn't want to do it. What was actually happening was Jesus kind of pulled the curtain back on his heart and said, hey, I know you want to follow me, but money and greed are sitting on the throne. For you to follow me, you got to get those things off the throne so I can sit on the throne. And the guy didn't want to do it. It was a throne issue that Jesus was revealing in that guy's heart. Let me just ask you a question. If today, if we pulled the curtain back, what's sitting on the throne? Is it a spouse? Is it a boyfriend? Is it a girlfriend? Is it sex? Is it money? Is it a job? Is it it your child? What, what, What is sitting on this throne? And what's at the heart of all this? Listen, what's at the heart of all this is Romans 125. The heart of every throne issue is this. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Right. At the heart of every single throne issue is worshiping the creation versus worshiping the creator of that creation. Yeah. And these, many of the things are good, right? Six days, God creates, it's good. But listen, none of those things are God. Right. It can be good, but that doesn't mean it's God. And if it's good and it's sitting on your throne, it's now an idol. And it's got to come off so the creator of those things, God himself, can come down and sit on the throne. Because let me, let me just tell you, the number one thing that wants to sit on the throne, it's not sex, it's not porn, it's not money, it's not greed, it's you. That's what wants to sit on the throne. That's Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, hey, I, I want to be God. I want to be like God, right? I want to call the shots. I want to be able to control what I do with my life. The number one thing that wants to sit on the throne of our life is us. It's us, and I think with that, it's that... You know, each and every one of us have been created to want and desire five things in life. That's security, it's love, it's acceptance, value, enjoyment, and significance. 
Each of us in this room, you that are online with us, you're created to want and to receive those things, that desire inside you. God put that desire in you. That's a healthy thing for you to want. But just as Johnson was alluding to many times, the problem is that what we do, instead of seeking those things from the Lord first, we actively go out and we look for those things in other people, in other things. So we look for it in a relationship or in money, right? If I just have this job, I will be significant, right? If I just have this guy marry me or this girl, if we have a relationship, man, I'll have that value, but God's saying, no, I'm the one that gives you that full value. And so what happens is we look to the created things to meet our needs rather than looking at the creator. And our ideas and our beliefs and our desires end up coming up here on the throne versus seeking God and letting him be on the throne. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. He's saying, seek me in these things. And so when we start looking for these things outside of relationship with God, what ends up happening is we actually become slaves to those different things. We're meant to have security, love, acceptance, value, enjoyment, and significance. Man, money is gonna give you security for a little bit, but it's not gonna give you all of that for a lifetime, right? The only thing that's truly gonna give you all of these things for a lifetime is a relationship with Christ. So you can be in this room and you're like, oh, I'm not a slave to anything. I, I, we really want you to pray. We want you to ask God, search my heart. David did this in the book of Psalms. He'd say, search my heart, oh God. Search my heart. This is a prayer we constantly need to pray. Search my heart. Point out the things in me that are wicked, Lord. God, are there any thrones in my life that I have put above you, that I put above your word? Jesus is saying, hey, let's get all these broken things off the throne they might give you a temporary satisfaction, a temporary enjoyment or fulfillment, but at the end of the day, he says, I wanna meet all your needs, and I'm the one who can only meet all of your needs and make you healthy, whole, and find freedom. Amen. You can find freedom in me. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a few minutes and we're gonna start praying through some of this stuff, okay? But um, before we do that, I wanna pause because I know that right about now, is when condemnation just settles into the room. And there's a difference between conviction and condemnation, okay? If you haven't heard that before, condemnation comes from the enemy. And condemnation says, hey, you messed up. You've sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, in fact, God doesn't love you anymore because of that. You should just give up and just continue the path you're already on because you can never come back to God. Conviction says, hey, you've sinned, you fall short of the glory of God, but the good news is God so loved the world and he wants to rescue you out of the miry pit and set your feet upon the rock and give you hope and joy and life and peace and help you to feel again because nothing numbs the soul more than sexual sin, right? And so God, God is offering us a way out of that. And uh, we've talked a lot in this series about you know, that, that statement that Jesus makes that it wasn't this way in the beginning trying to take us back to original intent. And so I wanna show us one more thing that God does at the beginning. Um, so in the beginning, right, is that right after Adam and Eve sinned, Genesis three, they reject God, they turn their back on God. And at the moment, I don't know if you ever role play, but I'm like, I'm thinking if I was God, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, reboot, right, you know? And um, thank God I'm not God, <laughs> yeah, that would not be good. And at the moment, that they turn their back on God, at the moment that they reject the Father, at the moment when he could have just, just wiped them out and started all over again, at the moment of, of the, now the nakedness has shame, at the moment, get this, at the, neck, at the moment that they are weaving together like fig leaves to cover over their nakedness, over their guilt, over their shame, Genesis 3.21 says this, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife Eve, and he clothed them. Amen. And that's way too easy to just breeze past. Many of us, we just, we read, you know, Genesis 3, and we just breeze right past that. At their worst, God made skins to cover over Adam and Eve. Now, the question is this, where did those skins come from? Mm -hmm. Because up until this point, nothing has died. 
So here's what I'm going to tell you. The next time the enemy is whispering in your ear that God doesn't love you, the next time that your sin is telling you that you could never recover, the, same, the next time that you feel dirty and you're making the judgments and the inner vows, the next time you feel like you could never come back from this, I want you to remember Genesis 3.21, and I want you to see that when Adam and Eve first sinned, that God killed the first animal. And God took the skins of that animal and he used those skins to cover Adam and Eve's shame and their nakedness. And that, friends, is called extreme foreshadowing. Because you fast forward and you find the perfect spotless lamb of God on the hill of Calvary, crucified for the sins of the world. And God takes that sacrifice, that death, and he uses it to cover our nakedness and to cover our shame and to cover our guilt and to make us new again. So you wanna really know what it was like in the beginning. In the beginning, there was a God who gave a second chance. And there was a God who made everything new again. And that's the same God we have today. And so let's do this. Let's take a second and let's bow our heads and let's talk to that God. <sighs> Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in the house of God, to talk to the people of God, to talk to those online who are, who are scattered. We have the opportunity to talk, to talk about your heart, to talk about your kingdom, and also talk about the plans of the enemy. We are not naive to believe that we don't have an enemy. And we know this, that sex is not the way that it should be in this world today, and because of that, there's harm that needs healing. And so what we wanna do is we wanna begin at this place of coming to Jesus some of us for the first time, some of us for the thousandth time. And coming back to this place, saying thank you that you so love the world. God, that you slayed your own son to cover over our sin, to cover over our shame, to make us new people, to give us hope in the future. Mm. <laughs> and we're gonna deal with these thrones in this moment. And so guys, here, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna pray through a few things over the next few minutes, but we're gonna start in this place of thrones and putting Jesus back in the right place. And so I invite you to pray this prayer um, with me. Say it like this. Say, God, I confess. I, confess. I have sought out other things sought out other instead, of you, instead of you for security, security. for love, for love. Acceptance, acceptance, value, value. Enjoyment, enjoyment, and significance. significance. That is sin. That is, and that is idolatry. It's idolatry. And right now, I turn from those things. From those things. And I remove, I remove every sin, every sin everything, everything, and every person and every off the throne, of my life. the throne of my life. All right, guys, just in your own heart, name it. Take 10 seconds and name it. What is it? If you can just even imagine a throne, a big throne over your life. What's sitting on that throne? Whatever it is, name it. And just in your own, your own mind's eye, remove those things by God's grace and God's power. Remove those things off the throne. Just for a second, I want you to envision a clean throne, empty throne. Mm. And say, God, I give you my sexuality. I give you control of my identity. Now let's say this together. I receive, I receive. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Son of God. as the only one who sits on the throne of my life as my king and my savior. And I'll follow you all the days of my life. I invite you, fill the void inside me right now with your love. Thank you, Jesus. All right, now that Jesus is back on the throne, Maybe on the throne for the first time. We're gonna we're gonna deal with these two other areas, soul ties and then inner vows and judgments. And here's the deal with soul ties, okay? Is that some of you um, may have done something like this before and you don't have any. Um, some of you may have some, some of you may have many. In fact, um, Summer and I ministered to uh, a girl actually who came out of um, the strip clubs and she had 75. 
So wherever you're at in that spectrum, I just want you to start thinking about this. God, who are you highlighting? Let's just name one person right now. Who are you highlighting? It could very likely could be physical or it could, let's not brush away. It could be emotional. Maybe there's an unhealthy emotional connection you have with somebody who's not even your spouse, right? It's just unhealthy and you know it. God's putting his finger on it, if, if that's the case. Um, the number one question we get is what about divorce? What if I'm divorced? Um, I don't know. We're not even gonna get into the circumstances that led to that. But here's what I'd say is that if, if you're divorced and one of you's remarried, you need to break that soul tie. And this is where it's gonna hurt because some of you have never actually experienced the finality of that divorce. So I wanna prepare you for that. Um, but if you're divorced and both of you are still single, I encourage you to pray. Just say, God, you know, I don't know what circumstances are going on, but God, you know, lead me in how to pray through this, okay? So let's, again, let's take 10 seconds and just say, God, reveal to me one person that, that you want to lead me through to cut this tie with. Now, here's the beauty of this, guys, is that we live in digital age, so you can go back through this message again and pray this prayer as many times as you need to, okay? Or you seconds. can also, we're gonna put this up on the screen. Yeah. You can take a picture of it now as well. All right, let's pray through this together. So not repeat after me, let's pray through it together, all right? Father, I confess I have engaged in a wrong sexual or emotional connection with, put the name in. I confess this as sin and ask you to forgive me. And Lord, I forgive them for any wrong that they have done to me. I reject the connection that was formed and ask you, Heavenly Father, to break any connection that was formed. Restore to me any part of me that I have lost and remove from me anything remaining from this connection. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. As you just received that, one of the things I just felt the Lord say, um, he just drew me back to the woman at the well who was accused of adultery. And after Jesus dealt with the Pharisees and dealt with everybody in the moment, he said, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So the reality is in a situation like this, when we're praying through this, the voice of accusation and the voice of shame can hinder us from fully wanting to even go there in prayer. But I feel like the Lord wants to say to those of you in this room and those of you on, online, neither do I condemn you. Pray through this and go and sin no more. You know, when I was talking about my story of trauma earlier, you know, after I repented of my judgments and my inner vows that I had created, um, and I asked God to come heal me, what I did in that moment as well, because see, those judgments and inner vows were rooted in a lie that I had believed so long about men. So in exchange for that, I, got, I asked God to come in and show me his truth and a picture of his protection. And I'll never forget that moment. I saw myself in our bedroom, our master bedroom, and I was sitting on the floor and I said, Jesus, I need you to show me a picture of your protection over my life. And I saw Johnson come behind me and wrap his arms around me like a bear hug. And then my visual of Jesus come behind Johnson and wrap his arms around the both of us. And when that happened, the pain was removed and the healing came in. I had been believing that lie for 25 years, but that lifted that inner vow and that judgment. So I wanna ask you a question. What if, what if some of the things you've been believing aren't true? What if? We can make vows and we can make inner vows and judgments based on life experience, but here's the reality is that God's word and God's truth preceded our life experience. Again, it doesn't deny what happened, but it allows God to come in and speak his truth and bring his healing into the moment. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. And listen, this doesn't just have to be with the opposite sex. This could be from a coach that you had in high school. It could be from a teacher or something, a judgment that you made, an inner vow that you created. 
And I want you to ask God this, say, Father God, are there any inner vows or judgments I have made that are hindering me from seeing life through your truth versus my experience? As he reveals those things, I want you to hold on to it. We're going to pray. And again, these prayers are up on the screen if you want to take a picture or watch it later. Let's pray this together, just as you did with Johnson with Soul Ties. Let's pray this together. Say, Jesus, I recognize the judgments I have made, and I want you to name the judgment. These judgments were made based on my life experience versus your truth. And right now, I repent and I turn from those judgments. From those judgments, I recognize I also made an inner vow. Jesus, I repent of the inner vow of, and I want you to just name whatever that inner vow is he just showed you. You say, I don't want to see life through this vow any longer, but through the truth of God. And I want you to say this now. Say, God, I surrender that inner vow to you, and I ask for that forgiveness. With a grateful heart, I receive your forgiveness, and I receive your promises over my life. As I have surrendered these inner vows and judgments to you, please show me your better truth. As you've just prayed that, I want you to close your eyes again. And just like I asked God for a picture of protection for me, I want you to ask God to show you a picture of his truth for you. Speaking to many of you right here, he's speaking to you online. Remember this picture, it's not gonna contradict his word, it's not gonna contradict his character or the nature of who Christ is. And just say, I receive your truth. I receive your truth, Jesus. Take a deep breath. Here's the beauty of this. You can pray these prayers. Some of you may need to go back through and really spend some time on these things. But um, we're going to pray one last, last prayer together. And this is kind of the one that I think is just kind of ties the entire series together. This is in my mind where we've been leading to be able to pray something like this. And so let's put this last prayer up here. And we're going to pray this together. Okay. Lord, Lord thank, thank you. you. Come on, out loud, come on. This is important. Lord, thank thank you for cleansing me of all these connections, connections, idols, judgments, judgments, and vows. I choose now to present my whole mind, will, emotions, and body to you as a living sacrifice. I choose to reserve the sexual use of my body for marriage only and to give my most intimate emotions to you and my spouse only. I reject the lie that my body is unclean or in any way unacceptable to you as a result of my past sexual experiences. I thank you for cleansing my mind from sinful memories as you restore my soul to wholeness and holiness. You have made me spotless. I am new. I am free. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 All right, this is, this is a journey, okay? This is a journey that we're on. Um, I, I wanna highlight just one more thing. For, uh, as we've gone throughout this series, we've talked about this specific website, uh, explicitseries.com, and where we put a lot of resources on that page, and I wanna, I wanna offer that to each one of you again. In fact, uh, this last week, we added at least two more videos from some of our staff pastors. One actually goes more into this topic about sexual healing, and another one, very niche, but very important, talking about how do you... Um, how do you help your kids if they've been exposed to something or something's happened to them? Those videos are actually living on that explicitseries.com page as well as how do I get involved in our class called Forward, which is super important. That's the next step for everybody as well as small groups. Um, There's a porn-free course, you know, things like that that are available on that page right there. Uh, But here's what what we're gonna do as we close out our time today, but really as we close out our series. um, if, If you're able in this moment, won't you stand up to your feet? And we're gonna take a second and we're gonna just worship God together, okay? And allow the song that we're gonna sing, let it to be the cry of your heart. Uh, This is more than lyrics. Allow this to be just something that comes from the inside of you and your declaration of how you're going to live moving forward from this point. Okay, let's lift up our voice to the Lord.